to our video service for the second Sunday of Easter, coming to you from Trinity Episcopal Church in Lumberton, North Carolina. service begins on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah! Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Faith is not easy. I think we can all agree that we as people of the 21st century have some challenges with our faith. In the midst of our skeptical world, that demands proof for just about everything. Faith is somewhat inward, subjective, mystical, even mysterious. It is something impossible to get a firm grip on faith. And as a result, it can seem like the life of faith leaves you feeling like you're hanging in midair sometimes. And at the end of the day, how can we be certain about things like God and redemption and the afterlife and ultimate destiny? As the great Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard put it, for every proof, there is some disproof. And yet it would seem that like the other Gospels, John's account, of the resurrection attempts to do just that. In our lesson for today, we are told that the signs Jesus did are recorded here so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Unfortunately, though, for some, that's just restating the problem, isn't it? For us as people of the 21st century, we are perhaps not moved by the signs that moved people in the first century. Miraculous events perhaps don't command the same kind of faith in some of us as they did for the people of the ancient times. But it's not just a modern versus ancient problem. To a great extent, this problem of verification is built into our search for faith. If it's faith, 
We can't prove it, can we? And if we can prove it, where's the need for faith? I guess that's why many of us find our gospel lesson for today so appealing. I think we tend to resonate with the doubts of Thomas. As people of our day, we, we don't want a faith that consists of just wishful thinking. This problem gets a lot of attention when it comes to Easter and, and the resurrection. Even St. Paul recognized that if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. So it would seem that there's a lot riding on whether something actually happened on that first Easter Sunday. Somehow, if Easter was merely a symbol or a vision or a spiritual experience of some sort, and if it had no relationship with the world, then the victory we proclaim over death seems less than real. Without Easter, what is there to distinguish the death of this one Jewish man from the countless other deaths that occurred at the hands of cruel oppressors? It does seem important that our faith rests on something more than wishful thinking. But when it comes to faith, we just cannot present an airtight case that demands a verdict. It's just not the way that faith works. At the end of the day, when we approach these matters solely with our intellect and with our logic, it would seem that the doors to faith are closed. So how do we find the faith to go out and, and live in light of the hope that God is working in the world to bring grace and mercy and peace and justice and love and joy in life to every life. Ironically, Easter gives us some help here, I think. Or perhaps we might say that the risen Christ gives us some help in some way that we simply will never be able to sufficiently explain or concretely prove. We continue to have the experience of the living Christ the same Jesus who surprised the first disciples huddled behind locked doors out of fear also surprises us behind locked doors of our doubts. Faith is not easy. The truth is, I think, that it has never been easy always. In some respects, we only find faith by having faith. It's very much like setting out on a journey with, without even knowing where you're going, like Abraham and Sarah. But the question we face is how do we who seem to be so full of doubt set out on that journey? I would say, like Thomas, that the answer is to pursue our doubts. It seems to me that genuine faith has always had helpings generous helpings of doubt. Many of us are like the father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark who brings his son to Jesus and asks for him to be healed. And he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I think that if you are honest enough and courageous enough to face your doubt squarely, then you will wind up with a faith that works for you. I think we've all seen through the myth that if you want to have faith, you have to banish your doubts. Most of us have had the experience that pursuing our doubts proves to be the path to a deeper faith. The questions raised by our doubts can provide the guidance and the motivation to set out on our journey of faith even when we don't understand where we're going even when we don't know where the road will lead us. Some might think of this scripture as implying that when Jesus arrives on the scene, all doubts are 
cast away. But that's not the way it works with Thomas. He doubts. He questions. He disbelieves. He's not satisfied with second-hand reports and wants to see for himself. And who could blame him? I mean, after all, he's been through a lot in the last few days. But Thomas does come to believe. He sees Jesus for himself, and after that experience, he not only assents or consents to the witness of his comrades, but makes the most profound confession of faith about Jesus found in the New Testament. But all that comes after he has had a chance to voice his doubts. And sometimes faith is like that. It needs the freedom of questions and doubt to really spring forth and take hold. Otherwise, faith might simply be confused with the, a repetition of creedal formulas or giving your verbal consent to the faith statements of others. But true, vigorous faith comes often from the freedom to question and wonder in doubt for many people. Thomas comes to faith because he first has the chance to voice his doubt and then experiences Jesus for himself. Know that God can use our questions as the means by which the Spirit works to create faith in us and to bless us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Almighty God who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.